Hi, my name is Leo, and today I will be reading the first chapter from the book Baptism of Fire from the Witcher series. Chapter 1 Birds were chirping loudly in the undergrowth. The slopes of the ravine were overgrown with a dense, tangled mass of brambles and barbary a perfect place for nesting and feeding. Not surprisingly, it was teeming with birds. Green finches trilled loudly, red poles and white throats twittered, and chaffinches gave out ringing vink vinks every now and then. The chaffinches called signals rain, thought Milva, glancing up at the sky. There were no clouds, but chaffinches always warn of the rain. We could do with a little rain. Such a spot, opposite the mouth of a ravine, was a good place for a hunter, giving a decent chance of a kill, particularly here in Brokelon Forest, which was abundant with game. The dryads who controlled extensive tracts of the forest rarely hunted, and humans dared venture into it even less often. Here, a hunter greedy for meat or pelts became the quarry himself, the Brokelon dryads showed no mercy to intruders. Milva had once discovered that for herself. No, Brokelon was not short of game. Nonetheless, Milva had been waiting in the undergrowth for more than two hours, and nothing had crossed her line of sight. She couldn't hunt on the move. The drought, which had lasted for more than a month, had lined the forest floor with dry brush and leaves, which rustled and crackled at every step. In conditions like these, only standing still and unseen would lead to success and a prize. An admiral butterfly alighted on the knock of her bow. Milva didn't shoot it away, but watched it closing and opening its wings. She also looked at her bow, a recent acquisition which she still wasn't tired of admiring. She was a born archer and loved a good weapon, and she was holding the best of the best. Milva had owned many bows in her life. She had learned to shoot. Using ordinary ash and yew bows, but soon gave them up for composite reflex bows of the type elves and dryads used. Elven bows were shorter, lighter, and more manageable, and owing to the laminated composition of wood and animal sinew, much quicker than yew bows. An arrow shot with them reached the target much more swiftly and along the flatter arc, which considerably reduced the possibility of its being blown off course. The best examples of such weapons bent fourfold here the elven name of Zephar, since the bow's shape formed that rune. Milva had used Zephar's for several years and couldn't imagine a bow capable of outclassing them, but she had, she had finally come across one. It was, of course, at the seaside bazaar in Sidoris, which was renowned for its diverse selection of strange and rare goods brought by sailors from the most distant corners of the world, from anywhere a frigate or galleon could reach. Whenever she could, Milva would visit the bazaar and look at the foreign bows. It was there that she bought the bow, and she thought she would serve her for many years. She had thought the Zephar from Zirikania, reinforced with polished antelope horn, was perfect. For just a year, twelve months later, at the same market stall, owned by the same trader, she had found another rare beauty. The bow came from the far north. It measured just over five feet. It was made of mahogany, had a perfectly balanced riser and flat laminated limbs, glued together from alternating layers of fine wood, broiled, boiled sinew, and whalebone. It differed from the other composite bows in its construction and also in its price, which is what had initially caught Milva's attention. When, however, she picked up the bow and flexed it, 
she paid the price the trader was asking without hesitation or haggling. 400 Novigrad coins. Crowns. Naturally, she didn't have such a titanic sum on her. Instead, she had given her, she had given up her Zeracanian Zephyr, a bunch of sable pelts, a small, exquisite, elven-made medallion, and a coral cameo pendant on a string of river pearls. But she didn't regret it, not ever. The bow was incredibly light and, quite simply, perfectly accurate. Although it wasn't long, it had an impressive kick to its laminated wood and sinew limbs, equipped with a silk and hemp bowstring stretched between its precisely curved limbs. It generated 55 pounds of force from a 24-inch draw. True enough, there were bows that could generate 80, but Milva considered that excessive. An arrow shot from her whalebone 55er covered a distance of 200 feet in two heartbeats, and a 100 paces still had enough force to impale a stag while it would pass right through an unarmoured human. Milva rarely hunted animals larger than red deer or heavily armoured men. The butterfly flew away. The chaffinches continued to make a racket in the undergrowth, and still nothing crossed her line of sight. Milva leaned against the trunk of a pine and began to think back, simply to kill time. Her first encounter with the Witcher had taken place in July, two weeks after the event of the Isle of Thanid and the outbreak of war in Dol Angra. Milva had returned to Brokilon after a fortnight's absence. She was leading the remains of a Scoia'tael commando defeated in Tameria during an attempt to make their way into war-torn Adern. The squirrels had wanted to join the uprising incited by the elves in Dol Blathana. They had failed and would have perished had it not been for Milva, but they'd found her in refuge in Brokilon. Immediately on her arrival, she had been informed that Algaes needed her urgently in Kul Sarai. Milva had been taken a little back. Algaes was leader of the Brokilon healers, in the deep valley of Kol Sarai, with its hot springs and caves, was where healing usually take place. She responded to the call, convinced it concerned some elf who had been healed and needed her help to re-establish contact with his commando, but when she saw the wounded witcher and learned what it was about, she was absolutely furious. She ran from the cave with her hair streaming behind her and offloaded all her anger on the owl guys. He saw me. He saw my face. Do you understand what danger that puts me in? No. No, I don't understand, replied the healer oddly. That is Gwyn Bleed, the Witcher, a friend of Brokolon. He had been here for a fortnight since the new moon. And more time will pass before he would be able to get up and walk normally. He craves tidings from the world, news about those who are close to him. Only you can supply him with that. Tidings from the world. Have you lost your mind, Dryad? Do you know what is happening in the world now, beyond the borders of your tranquil forest? A war is raging in Adern. Bruges, Tamaria, and Redania are reduced to havoc, hell, and much slaughter. Those who instigated the rebellion on Thanid are being hunted high and low. There are spies and Ingevar informers everywhere. It is sometimes sufficient to let slip a single word, make a face at the wrong moment, and you'll meet the hangman's red-hot iron in the dungeon. And you want me to creep around spying, asking questions, gathering information, risking my neck, and for whom? For some half-dead witcher. And who is he to me? My own flesh and blood? You've truly taken leave of your senses, our guys. If you're going to shout, interrupted the dryad calmly, let's go deeper into the forest. He needs peace and quiet. Despite herself, 
Milva looked over at the cave where she had seen the wounded witcher a moment earlier. A strapping lad, she had thought, thin yet sinewy, his hair's white, but his belly's as flat as a young man's. Hard times have been his companion, not lard and beer. He was on Thaned, she stated. She didn't ask. He's a rebel. I know not, said Algaze, shrugging. He's wounded. He needs help. I'm not interested in the rest. Milva was annoyed. The healer was known for her taciturnity, but Milva had already heard excited accounts from dryads in the eastern marches of Brucalon. She already knew the details of the events that had occurred a fortnight earlier, about the chestnut-haired sorceress who had appeared in Brucalon in a burst of magic, about the cripple with a broken arm and leg she had been dragging with her, a cripple who had turned out to be the Witcher, known to the dryads as Gwenbleed, the White Wolf. At first, according to the dryads, no one had known what steps to take. The mutilated Witcher screamed and, fainted by, and fainted by turns. Our guys had applied makeshift dressings. The sorceress cursed and wept. Milva did not believe that at all, who had ever seen a sorceress weep, and later the order came from Duan Canal, from the silver-eyed Ethene, Ethne, the lady of Brocolon, send the sorceress away, said the ruler of the forest of the dryads, and tend to the witcher. And so they did. Milva had seen as much. He was lying in the cave in a hollow full of water from the magical Brocolon springs, his limbs, which had been held in place using splints and put in traction, were swathed in a thick layer of the healing climbing plant, coninhaler, and turfs of knit bone. His hair was as white as milk. Unusually, he was conscious. Anyone being treated with coninhaler normally lay lifeless and raving as the magic spoke through them. Well, the healer's emotionless voice tore her from her revere. reverie. What is it going to be? What am I going to tell him? To go to hell, snapped Milva, lifting her belt from which hung a heavy purse and a hunting knife. And you can go to hell too, our guys. As you wish, I shall not compel you. You are right, you will not. She went into the forest, among the sparse pines, and didn't look back. She was angry. Milva knew about the events which had taken place during the first July new moon on the Isle of Thanid. The Scoyatel talked about it endlessly. There had been a rebellion during the Major's conclave on that island. Blood had been spilt and heads had rolled, and, as if on a signal, the armies of Nilfgaard had attacked Adern in Lyria, Lyria, and the war had begun, and in Temeria, Redania, and Kedwin, it was all blamed on the squirrels. For one thing, because a commander of Scoyatel had supposedly come to the aid of the rebellious mages of Thanid. For another, because an elf, or possibly half-elf, had supposedly stabbed and killed Vizimir, king of Redania. So the furious humans had gone after the squirrels with a vengeance. The fighting was raging everywhere, and elven blood was flowing in rivers. Ha, huh? thought Milva, perhaps what the priests are saying are true. After all, and the end of the world and the day of judgment are close at hand. The world is in flames. Humans are preying not only on elves, but on other humans too. Brothers are raising knives against brothers, and the Witcher is meddling in politics and joining the rebellion. The Witcher, who was meant to roam the world and kill monsters eager to harm humans, no Witcher, for as long as anyone can remember, has ever allowed himself to be drawn into politics or war. Why? There's even the tale of a foolish king who carried under water in a sieve, who took a hare as a messenger and appointed a witcher as a palatine. Palatine. 
and yet here we have the witcher carved up in a rebellion against the kings and forced to escape the punishment in Brokelon. Perhaps it is truly the end of the world. Greetings, Maria. She started. The short dryad, leaning against a pine, had eyes and hair the colour of silver. The setting sun gave her head a halo against the background of the motley wall of trees. Milva dropped to one knee and bowed low. And bowed low. My greetings to you, Lady Ethne. The ruler of Brokelin stuck a small crescent-shaped golden knife into a bast girdle. Arise, she said. Let us take a walk. I wish to talk to you. They walked for a long time through the shadow, through the shadowy forest. The delicate silver-haired dryad and the tall flaxen-haired girl. Neither of them broke the silence for some time. It is long since you were at Duan Canal, Maria. There was no time, Lady Ethne. It is a long road to Duan Canal from the River Ribbon, and I. But of course you know that I do. Are you wary? The elves need my help. I'm learning. I'm helping them on your orders, after all, at my request. Indeed, at your request. And I have one more, as I thought. The Witcher, help him. Milva stopped and turned back, breaking an overhanging twig of honeysuckle with a sharp movement, turning it over in her fingers before flinging it to the ground. For half a year, she said softly, looking into the dryad's silvery eyes, I have risked my life guiding elves from their decimated commandos to Brokelon. When they are rested and their wounds healed, I lead them out again. Is that so little? Have I done enough? Every new moon I set out on the trail in the dark of the night. I've begun to fear the sun as much as a bat or an owl does. No one knows the forest trails better than you. I will not learn anything in the green wood. I hear that the witcher wants me to gather news by moving among humans. He's a rebel. The ears of an inn give air prick up at the sound of his name. I must be careful not to show myself in the cities. And what if someone recognizes me? The memories still endure. The blood is not yet dry, for there was a lot of blood. Blood, Lady Ethne. A great deal. The silver eyes of the old dryad were alien, cold, inscrutable. A great deal indeed. Were they to recognize me, they, were in, they would impale me. You are prudent, you are cautious and vigilant. In order to gather the tidings of the witcher's requests, it is necessary to shed vigilance. It is necessary to ask, and now it is dangerous to demonstrate curiosity. Were they to capture me, you have contacts. They would torture me until I died or grind me down in Drakenborg. But you are indebted to me. Milva turned her head away and bit her lip. It's true I am, she said bitterly. I have not forgotten. She narrowed her eyes, her face suddenly contorted, and she clenched her teeth tightly. The memory shone faintly between beneath her eyelids and ghastly moonlight of that night. The pain in her ankles suddenly returned, held tight by the leather snare and the pain in her joints after they had been cruelly wrenched. She had heard again the sorting of the sowing of leaves as the trees shot suddenly upright, her screaming, moaning, the desperate, frantic, horrified struggle and the invasive sense of fear which flowed over her when she realized she couldn't free herself. The cry and fear, the creak of the rope, the rippling shadows, the swinging, unnatural, upturned earth, upturned sky, trees with upturned tops, pain, blood pounding in her temples. At the dawn, the dryads, all around her in a ring, the distant silvery laughter, a puppet on a string, swing, swing, marionette, and little head hanging down, and her own unnatural wheezing cry, and then darkness. Indeed, I have a debt, she said through clenched teeth. Indeed, for I was a hanged man cut from the noose. As long as I live, I see, I shall never pay off that debt. 
Everyone has some kind of debt, replied Ethne, such as life, Maria Bering. Debts and liabilities, replied Ethne, such as life, Maria Bering. Debts and liabilities, obligations, gratitude, payments, doing something for someone, or perhaps for ourselves, for in fact we are always paying ourselves back, and not someone else, each time we are indebted to pay off the debts to ourselves. In each of us lies a creditor and a debtor at once, and the art is for the reckoning to tally inside us. We enter the world as a minute part of the life we are given, and from then on we are ever paying off debts to ourselves, for ourselves, in order for the final reckoning to tally. Is this human dear to you, Lady Ethne, that, that witcher? He is, although he knows not of it. Return to Col Sarai, Maria Bering. Go to him and do what he asks of you. In the valley, the brushwood crunched and a twig snapped. A magpie gave a noisy, angry chatter, chatter, and some chaffinches took flight, flashing their white wing bars and tail feathers. Milva held her breath at last. Chaka, chaka, called the magpie. Chaka, 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 another twig cracked. Milva adjusted the warm polished leather guard on her left forearm and placed her hand through the loop attached to her gear. She took an arrow from the flat quiver on her thigh. Out of habit, she checked the arrowhead and the fletchings. She brought shafts at the market, choosing an average one out of every dozen offered to her, but she always fletched them to herself. Most ready-made arrows in circulation had two short fletchings arranged straight along the shaft while Milva only used spirally fletched arrows with the fletchings never shorter than five inches. She knocked the arrow and stared at the mouth of the ravine, at a green spot of barbary among the trees, heavy with bunches of red berries. The chaffinches had not flown far and began their trilling again. Come on, little one, thought Milva, raising the bow and drawing the hamstring, the bowstring. Come on, I am ready. But the roe deer headed along the ravine towards the marsh and springs, which fed the small streams flowing into the ribbon. A young buck came out of the ravine, a fine specimen, weighing in, she estimated, at foremost four stone. He lifted his head, pricked up his ears, and then turned back towards the bushes, nibbling leaves. With his back towards her, he was an easy victim, had it not been for a tree trunk obscuring part of the target. Milva would have fired without a second thought. Even if she were to hit him in the belly, the arrow would penetrate and pierce the heart, liver, or lungs. Were she to hit him in the haunch, she would destroy an artery, and the animal would be sure to fall in a short time. She waited without releasing the bowstring. The buck raised his head again, stepped out from behind the trunk, and abruptly turned round a little. Milva, holding the bow at full draw, cursed under her breath. A shot face on was uncertain. Instead of hitting the lung, the yellow head might have entered the stomach. She waited, holding her breath, aware of the salty taste of the bowstring against the corner of her mouth. That was one of the most important, quite invaluable advantages of her bow. Were she to use a heavier or inferior weapon, she would never be able to hold it fully drawn for so long without tiring or losing precision with the shot. Fortunately, the buck lowered his head, nibbled on some grass protruding from the moss and turned to stand sideways. Milva exhaled calmly, took aim at his chest and gently released her fingers from the bowstring. She didn't hear the expected crunch of ribs being, ribs being broken by the arrow. However, for the buck leapt upward, kicked and fled. A 
accompanied by the crackling of dry branches and the rustle of leaves being shoved aside. Milva stood motionless for several heartbeats, petrified like a marble statue of a forest goddess. Only when all the noises had subsided did she lift her hand from her cheek and lower her bow. Having made a mental note of the route the animal had taken as it fled, she sat down calmly. Resting her back against the tree trunk, she was an experienced hunter. She had poached in the Lord's forest from her child. She had brought her down her first roe deer at the age of eleven, and her first fourteen-point buck on the day of her fourteenth birthday. An exceptionally favourable augury and experience had taught that one should never rush after a shot animal. If she had aimed well, the buck would fall no further than two hundred paces from the mouth of the ravine. She would have been off target, a possibility she actually didn't contemplate. Hurrying might only make things worse. A badly injured animal, which wasn't agitated, would slow to a walk after its initial panicked flight. A frightened animal being pursued would race away at breakneck breakneck speed it would only slow down once it was over the hills and far away so she had at least half an hour she plucked a blade of grass stuck it between her teeth and drifted off in thought once again the memories came back when she returned to Brooklyn twelve days later the witcher was already up and about he was limping somewhat and slightly dragging one hip, but he was walking. Milva was not surprised. She knew of the miraculous healing properties of the forest water and the herb corn inhaler. She knew Aegis' abilities and on several occasions had witnessed his astonishing quick return to health of wounded dryads. The rumours about the exceptional resistance and endurance of witches were also clearly no myths either. She did not go to Kol Sarai immediately on her arrival, although the dryads hinted that Gwynblade Gwyn Gwyn had been impatiently awaiting and wanted to make her feelings clear. She escorted the squirrels back to their camp. She gave a lengthy account of the incidents on the road and warned the dryads about the plans to seal the border on the ribbon by humans. Only when she was rebuked for the third time did Milva bathe, change and go to the witcher. He was waiting for her at the edge of a glade by some cedars. He was walking up and down, squatting from time to time and then straightened up with a spring. Our gaze had clearly ordered him to exercise. What news, he asked immediately after greeting her. The coldness in his voice didn't deceive her. The war seems to be coming to an end, she answered, shrugging. Nilfgaard, they say, has crushed Lyria and Adern.